welcome back to everybody here in Geneva as well as uh, virtually. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to be welcoming our sixth panel of OS21 and our third panel of the day. We have a very exciting panel coming up. It's going to be entirely virtual um, and it's going to be a bit different from the panels that we've heard from before previously because it's slightly more technical so I'm looking to I'm looking forward to, the, to that shift in focus our next panel um, as I said fully virtual is going to be on verification mechanisms on how technology can aid in ensuring compliance with space security regulations and I'm very excited to introduce our excellent panelists first we have Mori Bidjar he is an associate professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at the Odin Institute for Computation Engineering and Science at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, secondly, we have Regina Pelsus. She is a senior policy officer, seconded from the German Space Agency at DLR uh, from the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. And thirdly, we have Curtis Hernandez. He is the Director of Government Affairs at Leo Labs. And moderating, we have Daniel Porras. He is the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Communications at Secure Foundation. I'm very excited to be introducing him because as some of you that have participated in previous um, aspect security conferences, he used to be the one that organized this. So it's, it's a great pleasure to be welcoming you back, Daniel. Um, so with that, uh, I cede the floor to you. Thanks so much, Almu. And hello, everyone. It's great to be back. Um, I've missed you all. And as you can see, I'm out here living in Colorado in a, in a mountain cabin, as I promised to do. Um, it's been a great experience, but of course, uh, I wish I could be there with you all in person. Um, Naturally, Secure World Foundation is still delighted to be a part of this project uh, and helping um, to continue the tradition of the Space Security Conference. And so hopefully today we're going to be bringing you some, some additional things to think about as all these new in initiatives are taking place right now um, surround, uh, around the space security topic. So today we've, uh, and yesterday we've had a lot of discussions about um, legally binding versus political uh, instruments, you know, norms versus treaties. And there is a reason for some of this. Uh, it's not just because some people have preferences uh, one way or the other. Um, and one of those reasons is verification. Um, and I don't necessarily just mean this in the verification sense that we in the space community often use that term, um, but more so in the, in the way that it's used in the arms control world, which is not just being able to monitor and ensure that everybody is following their legal obligations under a treaty, but also that you're able to do something about it uh, before somebody has a, the opportunity to take advantage of cheating on a treaty. So verification is a little bit trickier in the arms control world than it is necessarily in the space world. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is what can we see? Is verification actually a problem? Ten years ago, my colleagues at Secure World Foundation wrote a paper on the limitations of space situational awareness on being able to be used as a verification means for space activities. Well, 10 years later, 11 years late, later now, the technology has changed a lot. We have more telescopes, we have um, more computing power. Um, and we have a lot more actors who are involved in uh, space situational awareness. So in, during this panel, I'd like to kind of take it apart, um, find out what is it that we can actually see in outer space. Um, and in particular, I would like to have a discussion uh, with all of the diplomats, all the folks who are gonna be working on coming up with policies, shaping the policies. This is an opportunity for you to talk to some of the technical experts and ask them, you know, what are the limitations of our technology? Just how far can we go? And perhaps a better understanding of the technology will enable us to, to focus in on what are the areas that we can effectively address. So with that, first, um, I would like to turn to the policy person. Um, Regina, can you please tell us why is verification important to policy and, and why has it been a, a challenge for in international discussions over the last, say, you know, 10, 15 years? Thank you so much, Daniel, for the introduction and to Almudena and to Unidir and its partners um, for the invite to join you today. And also um, good afternoon to everyone on the panel and in the audience. Um, so thanks um, for, for this introductory question. And um, I would like to share some thoughts um, from the intersection of technology and policy um, on verification mechanisms and um, why verification is important, how we use um, space situational awareness 
our SSA technology for it, and then also highlight some uh, challenges that we're currently facing. Uh, one challenge that I believe uh, we're able to meet um, increasingly well, and another challenge that I think is um, getting quite uh, complicated and tricky. So first, um, why verification? Um, since the advent of uh, spaceflight, I think many of us um, I would agree that different actors have always been keen to understand what others are doing in orbit, uh, but then also to keep uh, their own assets uh, safe from both intentional threats and operational general risks. And whether we have a binding agreement or we have a non-binding norm or an established good practice, and I think we've discussed this uh, in the past two days uh, to, to really uh, uh, in-depth extent, we want to trust each other and have confidence and um, today that's within a community of uh, a lot of different actors, not just um, two superpowers, but uh, multiple state and non-state actors that are operating in orbit. And we may, uh, we may also wish to, um, while we have that trust, we may also wish to understand uh, if that trust has been translated into practice. And uh, we would like to be able to discover and describe if something that has occurred uh, in a certain way um, has a potential aftermath um, or long-term consequences after an event has unfolded. And it helps, I think, for the discussion to think that events or something that we want to observe or verify is a very malleable notion. And um, there's also time before the event, um, which is perhaps not so much verification related, but certainly uh, related to anticipation. Um, it's incredibly important uh, at the same time, and we use similar verification mechanisms that we, well, mechanisms that we use for verification, also for this anticipation. For instance, if we look at space traffic uh, and operational risks of conjunctions um, between two satellites, that we may discover several uh, days or hours in advance, uh, where ideally, of course, we don't want to wait for a collision to be verified in hindsight, uh, but prevented. So I guess there's some hindsight and some foresight in, in verification, or at least what we can do with SSA. How can we use SSA or space situational awareness technologies for this? SSA involves the monitoring and detecting of objects in orbit. We have perhaps an image here to illustrate um, some examples from, from the German side where we have um, different types of uh, sensors, some radars. On the right hand side, we have TIR. It's a large, you know, traditional looking radar. Um, it's not the, the only type of sensor class. There is, there are many other examples um, that uh, lots of different uh, state and non-state commercial actors have. Um, on the next one, you see a little bit inside one of those sensors, you have a large tracking dish with, with, uh, which can lock on and observe and measure objects uh, at a certain range. And then you can use this data, if you go to the next slide, to um, survey and, uh, and uh, uh, sweep some, some areas of the sky in, in some areas uh, or orbit or range that are of interest for you. And then on the next slide, you can see how very on a very high level of abstraction, how we can use this type of data then to create actionable products or to um, feed this data into a catalog, enrich it with other type of information to get a more or less complete and accurate picture of the so-called space situation and be aware of it. And this brings me to my first challenge, which is complexity and then goes back to the next and, and final um, slide, which um, is basically that the backdrop, um, you know it all, uh, against which we verify has become much more dynamic and complex uh, over the course of the uh, past decade and will be compounded uh, in the future by the sheer activity that we currently see in orbit. We have an unprecedented number of objects uh, in space that increases every month. We have ever smaller and miniaturized objects, and we have a lot of novel forms of operations that uh, you know you need to understand and uh, understand the signatures uh, of. And in this complexity, there's a lot of ambiguity that you have to untangle. Um, if you're looking at something, for instance, the question is not just what is it uh, and where, but also what is it doing? Are we seeing, for instance, the observable effects of an anomaly uh, inside the satellite, which is completely operational, or uh, is it an intentional uh, manipulation on the part of someone else? Uh, what's the behavior? What's the impact of that? And I think we've already heard um, a great panel yesterday on dual use, uh, which really highlighted that some activities and systems um, that we perhaps be able to see, would be able to see with uh, SSA technology, um, can be interpreted in very different ways. And there's also, of course, a lot of other activities and, and threats and, and risks that we uh, cannot see because they're non-kinetic and that are very hard to verify 
uh, with SSA. So there are some limitations, but SSA can provide us, let's say, with the first clue at an, an entry point to uh, start an investigation, for instance. And while SSA can contribute to transparency in that way, it is really the ambiguity of this complex environment and the dual um, ways of, uh, of, of using space objects, some space objects, um, this ambiguity that is really hard to tackle um, for us, but it's also crucial for us uh, to address in order to avoid misperception and miscalculation. And the second challenge um, is also quite difficult, but I think we've come a long way already in, uh, in uh, making some progress there, and that is cooperation in uh, SSA and for SSA infrastructure. Because sensors, the ones that uh, you've seen uh, before, for instance, um, are quite costly. Many of them are bespoke and quite exquisite, not all of them, and increasingly not. But even if you have such a beautiful sensor, um, you need geographical coverage. Um, that means you need to perhaps place it in certain locations uh, on, uh, on the ground. And that means um, you benefit from, from cooperation with other actors who may have these um, type of locations or expertise. So SSA really lends itself uh, to cooperation. Um, and aside from that, it's obviously a concern for everyone that the uh, orbital environment remains um, safe uh, and secure and sustainable. And this cooperation can assume very various formats. For instance, uh, internally inside a government, um, we cooperate a lot across agencies and across uh, ministries, um, including uh, uh, cooperating with military and uh, um, civilian stakeholders. And on an international scale, of course, we benefit like many others um, uh, from the data sharing programs uh, for SSA data provided by the US. Um, on the multilateral cooperation side, um, I want to highlight um, one effort that we're deeply engaged uh, when, uh, uh, in on the European Union side, which is the um, uh, European Space Surveillance and Tracking Program, or EUSST, where we have been fusing sensor infrastructure and sensor technology uh, across a growing group of uh, member states for the past six years. Uh, we share SSA data every day in a dedicated catalog, and we provide operational SSA services to over 130 organizations uh, in Europe, including collision avoidance for over 230 European satellites. And while for the moment it's for European users, um, as part of the new European uh, space program, we may be able to extend this also to a wider community. And this type of cooperation, um, that's my final note, is not trivial um, for a number of reasons uh, related to technical and security issues that perhaps we can address a little bit later as part of our discussion. Um, but there's been some significant and very concrete progress in the past decade. And on that uh, perhaps hopeful note, I'll hand back to you, Daniel, and thank you for your attention. Right, so as, uh, as Regina was saying, um, you know, Space situational awareness is going to play a key role if we're going to find any types of measures that we would like to not only to uh, to communicate about, but to have um, confirmation of a follow through that if someone is communicating, you know, oh, this mission is going to be in this orbit and is going to be conducting these maneuvers. Um, we all need to have uh, some way to be able to confirm that that's actually what happened. Um, and so that actually leads me into uh, the, the next presentation. Um, and we're going to go ahead and answer another question here that's popped up in the Q and A about putting telescopes in orbit. Um, and maybe we're not going to be talking about telescopes, um, but radars. And Curtis, um, you work for one of the premier companies that is um, doing work in low Earth orbit in particular. Um, tell us, uh, as a technical expert, and please try to keep this in simple terms for us policy folks. Um, what can we see in low Earth orbit? Um, you know, what what can you uh, on, a, on a daily basis? What is it that you're able to tell about activities in low Earth orbit? And what are the limitations of that technology that you have at the moment? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel, for that uh, uh, introduction and, and stimulating that question is pretty good. Uh, thank you to my uh, fellow panelists here this morning. I'm glad to uh, participate in this discussion. Thanks to you for hosting today. Uh, great question. Uh, what can you see? What can we do right now? Uh, to put it in numbers very quickly, uh, right now, through Leo Labs uh, uh, sensor network, we're able to track about 17,000 objects, and that list is uh, growing rapidly as we're uh, operators launching to low Earth orbit right now. Uh, through Leo Labs network, we're primarily focused on the low Earth orbit region, um, so we're not looking out to the geo uh, areas, but there are other, other commercial companies that do the same thing. 
Uh, one of the primary drivers for this is the lack of coordinated sensors across, or at least drivers for the labs, the lack of coordinated sensors across the globe that contribute to uh, a good understanding of what is actually out there in low Earth orbit. Uh, with the planned 36,000 new satellites uh, uh, coming online in the next five years, uh, having this sensor network to understand what is actually out there, what folks are doing and how they're doing is, is, is pretty uh, necessary right now. Uh, so we believe commercial capabilities can fill that gap on the availability, or I should say the lack of availability of good data to drive uh, future conversations such as this, uh, to develop patterns of behavior, to understand what norms of behavior can be established from there and how we can start to characterize hostile versus non-hostile activities in lower Earth orbit regions with this uh, rapidly growing numbers of operators in that region. So from Leo Labs, we uh, endeavor to build out a global network with the goal of tracking every object, every orbit. And right now, we are currently operating four radar sites around the planet uh, with, si uh, with six radars um, uh, total on those. Our first radar was built in Poker Flats, Alaska. We followed that up rapidly with a, with a new radar in Texas. Both of those are UHF phase array radars. And then we uh, grew quickly into New Zealand and operated the first uh, Southern Hemisphere S-band radar out there. Um, and that's been providing uh, in incredibly good data for us through the COVID crisis um, with limited maintenance uh, being necessary to maintain operations out there. And then this past April, we opened up our newest site in Costa Rica, another S-band phase array radar, where we're able to uh, track uh, low flyers uh, close to the equator. Um, and come this uh, January, we'll be opening up a new site in the Azores, uh, contributing to uh, any potential gaps coming over the Atlantic uh, on the ability to detect. Uh, a driving understanding for us is, uh, in Leo Labs at least, is being able to put enough sensors, as Regina was speaking of, uh, enough sensors in geographically optimal locations so that you could track every object, every orbit. Um, with a goal of having at, uh, a minimum of three, uh, 30 minutes between each pass of a radar going through. The other important aspect of this is getting the data out to users, decision makers, operators uh, rapidly. So we have, uh, right now we are able, from the time a object passes through one of our radars, we're able to disseminate that information uh, within eight minutes in the form of a state vector or uh, within 45 seconds of that pass. Uh, do the 70 million computations and derive a uh, conjunction data message that we could disseminate if that object is going to have any impact on the rest of the, uh, the objects in, in those orbital regions. But you go down to, uh, to things such as, uh, folks have mentioned the word uh, transparency in this discussion, right? What kind of sensors is it? And for us, that, that equates to what's the performance of our overall network? How does that translate into decision making? What's the quality of that? And we're able to disseminate that uh, information. We, we put it on our website routinely. You know, we show what the actual object count is, what radars were uh, tracking such objects, uh, when those detections were made, and what's the data that goes along with it. But we don't really like to use the word transparency too much because it's kind of broad, kind of, uh, you can think a lot of different uh, aspects in there. So we like to, to uh, hone that down to three terms. Uh, truth, trust, and traceability, especially when you're having a discussion such as this one on uh, how would you do verification measures? What's the truth of the data? So you have to have, um, you have to disseminate how the radar is operating, what's the latency associated with that data, what's the quality of the track that you're able to derive from that data or those radar passes, and then build a network of trust on folks who, who are using that and are able to share with you um, their orbital regimes. For instance, the operator specifically is where we will really, really want to build the trust mechanism. Where they share our ephemeris with us, we share or we sell her radar data to them. And then we're able to build a trust relationship between the two entities to really uh, communicate what is happening. And from there, you can then start to build a wide range of traceability on those objects um, and uh, perhaps build a map of what's happened in low Earth orbit. So you can say, hey, we notice some activity in certain regions of, of the Leo realm. Uh, we can trace it back to when an event happened, when, when, when did a maneuver occur? Was that in fact a powered maneuver? Was it a, a space weather phenomenon that occurred? Was there an anomaly on that, on that spacecraft? So you can trace it back to when the event happened and perhaps do some forensics to, uh, to then characterize it. Was it a hostile, non-hostile, uh, 
uh, a naturally occurring event or whatnot, and therefore you're able to uh, uh, mitigate any misperceptions or miscalculations that Regina was talking about in her uh, opening uh, discussion here. So a number of things that we could do uh, and see, if you would. Um, right now, we're able to do uh, uh, operations such as change detection, what's happening, when does it happen? Um, we can do proximity monitoring with our, with our uh, mobile network. Uh, we have gotten uh, uh, very quickly into launch tracking, uh, especially with these missions such as transporter launches. Uh, how many objects are coming off a dispenser? Can we characterize those uh, rapidly and, and try to differentiate what's coming off a uh, dispenser ring and what's not? Um, we do constellation monitoring, uh, conjunction notifications, screening of maneuvers from various operators. And then, uh, as we announced earlier this summer, doing compliance and governance uh, with the nation of museums. Everything that's launched off New Zealand is uh, they're using the Leo Labs platform to do a, a governance and compliance uh, a confirmation to confirm that they're compliant with OST parameters. So, uh, a lot of different products. Where we're going with this is being able to develop and disseminate patterns of life on different uh, objects in, in low Earth orbit. Uh, building a characterization of objects that are down to two centimeters with our S band radars. And then uh, using that rich data set to drive that discussion and development of norms of behavior. What has happened, what is happening, and what could happen. Um, and with that, those are the things that we can see right now. Um, and we will get better as we grow out the rest of our network. As mentioned before, we plan to do every object, every orbit. So our, our strategic goal is to build a global network of 24 radar sites with 48 radars total. Therefore, you're able to do that uh, mapping of the entire LEO realm um, with the limited uh, gaps uh, involved. Perfect. Um, and you bring up another issue that um, I think Mariba is in a perfect place to, to discuss. Um, Mariba, I'm going to throw a little curveball at you. I, I was going to ask you a separate question, but um, we keep coming up uh, to the this question of sharing data, of um, bringing data together so that we can get a better idea of what's going on, getting a better picture. Sir, you have tons of experience in bringing data together. Um, what can you tell us about um, how this has enabled you to have a better picture of, of what's happening in orbit right now um, and, and really getting a, a, a clearer understanding of um, uh, what activities are taking place? Uh, thank you for that. And, um, you know, glad to be here uh, with everybody from here from Austin. Um, Here's the truth about sensors and stuff. All sensors lie. There's no truth sensor. Um, and sensors have limited capability to inform us of stuff. And so aggregating data is definitely what, what you want to be able to do because each, each type of sensing mechanism has its own limitations. Um, we don't have, we don't have ubiquitous sensing. We're not continuously and persistently observing and monitoring all objects all the time. So, so I, that would be a nice goal. We can try to achieve that asymptotically to, to be a bit nerdy about it. Uh, you know, maybe achieving that is unobtainium. Certainly we should go in that direction, but, uh, you know, at best, any given, uh, source of information is an opinion about stuff in space. And because there isn't persistent monitoring, Daniel, um, in between the observations, right? If you want to know something, you have to measure it. And if you want to understand something, you have to predict it. That's the, that's the model that I have, uh, you know, my students recite all the time in between observations, in between measurements, you don't know. And so you hypothesize some stuff. And I think there's a danger in basically using prejudice to remove your uncertainty and ambiguity and just say, okay, well, Here's my hypothesis, and so, so long as my hypothesis explains the evidence, I'm just going to assume it's true. Well, are you sure that you have all the possible hypotheses, no matter how improbable those may be? And so I think the big lesson that I've learned uh, as a data scientist, I'm going to use that phrase, even though that's, it's like the, you know, recently that's like become a thing, but people like me have been doing that for, you know, several decades now. And, uh, it was just, you know, processing data. But uh, what I've learned is really you want to aggregate as many different independent. So independent observations is key to help you confirm or refute a hypothesis. We have to be very careful that people aren't just uh, kind of 
just passing along the same data from a common source. I mean, you see this in the news, right? Somebody says something in the news, and then you have a bunch of other people that pretty much uh, use the same soundbite for their own kind of outlets. We have to be very careful when we're doing this monitoring for compliance that we actually do aggregate independent observations so that so that the conclusions that we can draw from using inferential statistics uh, we want to infer things and, and anything that we infer again is mired in uncertainty and i think that's one of the big things that i don't see respected i think writ large in ssa everybody wants to say oh well i have a covariance or whatever man there's like so many flawed assumptions in that whole idea that everything's Gaussian and all this other stuff. So I think we need to respect the problem, aggregate independent sources of information, know that we're not observing the truth, but we but we can get uh, as close as we can. And I would say dimensions of data quality. I think Curtis uh, alluded to some of this stuff, but we're really, you know, there's, there's a formal thing called dimensions of data quality. And, and a few of those things are timeliness of, of, of data completeness of the data, uniqueness, uh, consistency, validity, and accuracy. Those, those six dimensions of data quality, and people can Google it and find out more if they want, we need to apply those uh, when we look at how we monitor and independently kind of verify and assess uh, what people are doing. And oh, by the way, sensors don't detect hostile activity. So, so I, I got bad news for people that when there is no sensor that does that. So that is something that has to be inferred from a bunch of other stuff that has nothing to do with physics. And um, it has a lot to do with social science and these sorts of things. And so the framework has to actually incorporate both these things. But anyway, I'm going to be quiet for now. And there's a lot more that I could say about this topic. Mariba, I'm going to come back to you on the on the question of intent in just a moment, but um, first I'm going to pop back over to Regina. Let me ask you, Regina, um, we keep talking about sharing information and sharing data. Um, we also live at a time when we don't necessarily trust one another all that well. Um, what are some ways that we might be able to share data and information, or, or what could be some models that you know different states or different non-state actors even um, could try and incorporate some data so that we can get a, maybe an objective picture of what's happening and uh, in orbit. Thank you. I think it's it's a great question because it really addresses the the let's say practical opportunities that we have, but also some of the um, of the obstacles that we may face or that we may be put put in our way um, uh, because uh, we we are still operating with a paradigm that's that's not changed as as much, for instance, as uh, as the market or or the um, sharing of data, for instance, on Earth observations. So the other way around, if you will. So, I mean, I've, I've mentioned EUSST um, earlier, so um, we, we managed to um, share data um, of our sensors and, and combine it and fuse it and calculate with it across a group of different state actors. Um, in Europe, we use um, a lot of uh, state, civilian, military, um, um, academic, but also commercial sensors that we, that we integrate in our network. Um, of over 40 sensors at the moment. So we have found a way to, um, uh, to share data on a daily basis through this um, uh, database that we have put in place, a uh, dedicated uh, base from which we then calculate the catalog. That's one way um, and one, let's say, nascent emergent way of doing it. Um, and that uh, involved a lot of uh, talking, trust. It involved a legal basis uh, for setting up this uh, framework in Europe. Um, and now it's matured into a program and it's really involved a constant dialogue and a const on the policy side, but also on the technical side. So we've really had people talking about um, how we calibrate um, sensors so that you can really compare things. I mean, Moriba and uh, Curtis highlighted the point of, you know, is the, can the data be um, compared and can you um, kind of corroborate things with different types of data and is it, is it true? Um, so we, we do this on, on the technical side, there's a lot of um, things to check. Then we um, uh, have to look at the security implications. I mean, there may be some objects that um, our, we or our partners with whom we have uh, also data sharing agreements may not wish to disclose for several reasons. I think the trend in general is that we all try to not over classify, of course, because uh, it, it doesn't help anymore. But there's, of course, some commitments that we still have. 
And we also um, then integrate, um, we use data then from different catalogs, for instance, the 18th Space Control Squadron in the US, but we also use data from operators who we actually serve and they give us their ephemeris and, and we, we, um, we tie that up and we use all these different data sources to then um, uh, uh, produce our products. And there are many other um, really interesting um, uh, uh, endeavors in the, in, in the world. I mean, there's different sensor sources. Um, I mean, Curtis has highlighted Oh, excuse me, uh, Curtis has highlighted, um, you know, what they're doing on the commercial side. We have other commercial operators of uh, satellites and fleet to uh, push their data together, like the Space Data Association. We have a lot of um, endeavors that I think um, we, we see and that have really developed and are doing really fantastic work. And we need to see in the future how we can put these pieces that are developing and growing, let's say, on a regional or in a, a cross regional scale mm. to a Euro, uh, to a uh, global global scale and i think that's going to be the challenge well, that, for and that was going to be my next future. you know my next question let me poke you a little bit to see if i can be uh, slightly more provocative but um you mentioned that there are european efforts and you know that you're working with american allies but is this data sharing cutting across cultural lines um is it is it strictly a, a western cooperation or um, you know, do we see any sharing of data and, and information so far um, with other countries and other uh, state actors who are beyond our cultural circles? I think it's an ex excellent point. And I think um, if we want to have robust, uh, a robust base, I think um, Moriba highlighted this earlier, we really need to integrate a lot of different, different uh, viewpoints. And I think especially when we talk about verification, the ultimate question in the end is, we can have a fantastic catalog, uh, great sensors that we really, you know, that we really triangulate and, and whatnot. But in the end, if someone from, let's say, a non-like-minded person, um, um, a state, doesn't uh, has has another another information or other data, then the question is, whose data do we all mm -hmm. act upon? What do we want to look at? And right now, um, I think um, we're going step by step. Um, we're having this uh, approach in Europe. We've added. Um, states to our um to our uh, group um uh, bit by bit and we're currently in another enlargement process uh for for this group in the beginning it was really let's say the the nations that are already operating maneuverable assets or that have ssa capabilities and we've branched out to more of them of course we uh, cooperate with others but i think the next step is to maybe make um, some products available um, um across these boundaries we already do that in the European Union with, with other programs where we uh, um, uh, make data available uh, to the global community. And perhaps this can happen in, in SSA. We have the prerequisite um, uh, framework for this for now. And I think this is something that we're gonna see in the future where at least we share some of the, um, the products and some of the, um, maybe some of the services. But I think the uh, sharing of data is something that we need to work on uh, in the future perhaps. Like the, the basis of all good relationships, trust is built on good communication. Um, Curtis, Mariba, um, I'd like to come to the two of you. Uh, this is an issue that is always perplexing um, a lot of policy experts and, uh, and, and those um, policy wonks who are looking at space security that don't necessarily understand the technology. What can you tell about, uh, or what can you predict about space activities. When you see an object take off in a particular orbit and maybe it's doing some maneuvers, you know, what what can you actually predict about where it's going, um, you know, potentially what it could be doing, what it's for, um, and how would you even go about uh, coming to some of this information? Curtis, if I can start with you. Well, you can, you can predict uh, where it's headed, right? Uh, that's probably the, the first thing you, you need to do. Um, you really can't tell the why, though. I think uh, Marie would make a good point on uh, trying to try intent, uh, and that becomes the challenge here. Uh, why did a spacecraft maneuver? Why did it launch out in a certain uh, trajectory? Um, those are unknown. Um, that's where you have uh, the necessity to communicate amongst uh, operators uh, as to why they want to do this. Um, is it does it become kind of like a light plan publish publication type of mechanism? Hey. I intend to move on day at this time in this direction um, and then disseminate that uh, in, in some way or shape or form where that where everyone could understand this is why something is happening. Uh, but you also have to be able to characterize those unanticipated events, right? Is there a change detection? 
uh, and then go back to the traceability uh, parameter. When did it happen? Why did it happen? Where was it in, in its orbit? Um, and then you could fuse that with other types of information, not necessarily orbital data information, but perhaps there's, there's an indication in the stock market that uh, caused some maneuver, or maybe there was a crisis on another side of the planet and you have an imaging type of capability that could uh, see where flooding is occurring. Um, so you would have to uh, apply other mechanisms or other sources of information, not just orbital data, to derive why is something occurring. Uh, that's one aspect of this discussion uh, going on. But uh, you could uh, see coplanar adjustments. So what's happening within that plane or in that certain orbit? Who else is near there or who else is out there in that region? Those are things you can de derive from a variety of, of space uh, uh, radar this is operating within that neighborhood, if you would. Uh, what the potential impact in that region of space? So those things you can do with the officer, able to say who's there, what are they doing, what type of spacecraft is it, what type of capabilities is it have offered, um, and then do the upward matching. Is it weather or something across there? Marie, but what do, what do you think, sir? Um, what, what can you tell, or, or or what are some of your plans for being able to determine? You know, can can we see intent? Can can we try to garner that um, from other types of information? And how do we fuse that uh, with with space data? Yeah, so um, I think the thing to say is this, right? Um, I I take I take what I call this maximum entropy principle approach to stuff, which is to say. Given evidence, enumerate all the hypotheses that could explain said evidence, no matter how improbable those may be. In terms of being able to predict behavior, um, you know, one of the first things that we try to determine about an object, right, is its orbital trajectory. Orbital energy is like the easiest thing to determine. Uh, you know, what, what's the orbital energy and the inclination of that orbit with respect to the Earth's equatorial plane? Those tend to be the easiest thing. T TLEs, two line elements, tend to be awesome at that. Um, where in the orbit is a satellite? TLEs aren't so good at, uh, but you need a little bit more information. And these are what I call, <clears throat> excuse me, kinematic properties. Kinematic meaning geometry. The, the orbital geometry of, of, of the object. And then again, you know, we, we have some physics models, but actually, Daniel, there are five, five things are responsible for our interpretation or understanding about objects. One is the actual physics. Two, our model of the physics, which are inaccurate and imprecise. So, so we actually don't know the physics exactly. So the errors in that, the discrepancy between what we model and reality, uh, those two things contribute to uh, our perception. The third, the source of information that we use, okay, with all the nuances, the biases, noise, corruption, so on and so forth. The fourth is our models of those sources of information, which also are, don't match one to one. And the last one is our choice of method for inference, you know, inference or interpretation. So actually, even though the, there's a real object and it's a behaving a certain way and it's going to do certain things, our ability to predict is constrained by all those five things. And you need to enumerate hypotheses related to these, these sorts of things. Now, uh, you know, once you can understand kind of orbital geometries and that sort of thing, the next thing that you can get to, hopefully, is then trying to characterize physical characteristics of the object. Every object has its own personality, first and last name. So can you combine sources of information to get an idea of the object's size, shape, material pro properties, orientation, these sorts of things, which by the way, in the catalog, there, there's no catalog of objects right now available that gives you all these quantities, everything, even, even the Department of Defense's catalog m models every object like a cannonball. They're all spheres. And I can tell you there aren't many spherical satellites, just like there are very few spherical cows and horses that exist, right? So that is, that's an error. I mean, 
be, because things don't behave like cannonballs in space, uh, that is a discrepancy that we need to reconcile at some point. And then even moving a bit further, the next thing that we want to figure out are functional and operational properties of objects. That takes different types of, of, of data and sources of information. And when we want to get to intent, we're really looking at this, right? Then it's like <clears throat> opportunity and capability to cause harm. Those are things that physical sensors can provide some information on. Intent, not so much. And so I think this is where we have to look towards anthropology, social science, geopolitical trade winds, culture, and say, okay, <clears throat> if we as humans, if we have humans have different behavior as humans based on where we were born, how we were raised, that sort of thing, why should we expect that when we operate satellites, we're just going to be all the same? That's nonsensical. That's naive. It's nonsensical. It's mm. dumb to actually assume that. And, and, and it's probably far from the truth. And so we need to say, okay, given these operators from this country, how are they interpreting space laws, space policy guidelines? Can we measure their behavior somehow and ascribe, remember I said, enumerate all the hypotheses that can explain the evidence. Is there a hypothesis that is culturally based that when we apply it to the evidence explains said evidence? My guess is that there's going to be a, an, an, an ensemble of hypotheses, some that are going to be mired in mm. malicious behavior and others that have nothing to do with malicious behavior. It's all a d cultural difference. And I think that there, we haven't seen enough of that applied. Some of that is what we're working on at UT Austin with Astrograph and all that is to basically use natural language processing as a sensor of semantic things to pull in a corpus of human based behavior and try to apply it towards what we observe in terms of how space objects behave. That way, when we talk about prediction, the prediction isn't just physics. The prediction is given a common scenario. How are these two space actors going to behave? Can we predict that based on what they've done before? So the, the, very much the social scientific aspect needs to be incorporated in this. And, and that's something that we're we're working on, uh, you know, fervently here at, uh, at UT Austin. Bernie bring, brings up some good points on that. Um, you do need to have an understanding of what the historical operations of several op operators are. Um, and you need to collect that now so that you have a baseline of data from which to build those characterizations of what our operators and what have they done in the past. And then you can start building a baseline of what's the potential of these same activities done again in the future. So collecting that data now gives you that source of good facts upon which to base your hypothesis uh, going forward, leading to better predictive uh, uh, capabilities in the future. Knowing how to, you know, where do we combine all that information? Who gets to hold on to it and then sort of be the the disseminator of this objective uh, of this objective data that hopefully everyone can then look at and say, all right, this is a trusted source. Um, the the data has been compiled and, and we brought it together. Daniel, Daniel yeah. yeah, so here's the thing, right? I think if we try to find, if we try to do this in a Lord of the Rings, one ring to rule them all, one, one repository to rule them all, we, we're going to fail. We're, that's just not going to happen. The world doesn't want to do that. We have clear signs that the world doesn't want to do that. So we shouldn't try to force that from, you know, in happening. One, one of the models that I actually embrace uh, and I love is the, uh, you know, International GNSS Service or IGS, right? Mm -hmm. IGS uh, is, is, is an international uh, entity where there are redundant data centers and analysis centers. So there's no single point of failure. There's actually, uh, you know, distributed nodes where, where, where these uh, sources, these, this information, that these databases, they're all kind of cop copied, right, everywhere. So, so anyone fails, you got you know, a gazillion other places that you can go. And they cross compare it against each other and that sort of stuff. I like that model a lot because I think people are uh, more ready to embrace such a thing. I think the critical thing that we need to start looking at is there's no kidding science and technology that needs to be developed. And I hear this all the time. People say, oh, we don't have technical challenges and like SSA and this stuff. I'm like, 
I don't know what planet you come from, but clearly you're you're on, in the wrong place or whatever it is that you're doing in your off time is colluding your ability to think, you know, rationally. There, of course, there are lots of technical challenges. Trying to aggregate heter heterogeneous data, so disparate data uh, with different time scales, different phenomenologies, different errors and biases and these sorts of things. Some of it comes from human inputs, others come from physics. That has not been solved yet. And that's exactly what we need to do to be able to do this sort of stuff. Um, um, Mori highlighted earlier, you know, do we have some kind of fidelity of what we see in orbit? And I, I want to just highlight one point. We have these, this huge diversity of assets in orbit. First of all, they get more and more, and then there's debris and so forth. But even with um, um, objects that we have in orbit, uh, um, in themselves, they're so different, uh, ranging from um, huge uh, coach-sized, exquisite, decade-old um, uh, bespoke assets that we um, uh, kind of where we have to update our own models of them all of the time because we haven't um, touched or accessed them for or seen them for you know a couple of decades after they were launched and uh, uh, we've we've seen them probably for the last time when they were integrated um, and they are degrading in a way and and things can happen and on the other hand we have um, you know um, self similar small um, batch produced um, standardized objects that may fail or not, but they, they are quite easy to understand and easy to, to, to model in a way. I mean, uh, Mariba mentioned um, the, the, the ball, and that's true. They, you know, they're not a sphere, they're, they're all kinds of things. And we've, what we've seen in operations of, of, um, uh, of those missions that have been operating for quite some time, and I think we can learn a lot of lessons there, even from, you know, from interplanetary missions, that even operations teams need to understand their own assets in a way. And, Often we haven't um, yet documented uh, well enough what the satellite um, is, where, where, where we have obviously documentation about where certain subsystems are, but everything's degrading at some point. We don't have complete high fidelity models of everything that we have up there. So that injects another um, aspect of uncertainty when even operations teams uh, who, who know their spacecraft inside out need to make certain assumption of what's happening inside after having operated it for, for a long time because everything's degrading and there is indeed entropy. The challenge gets even harder and harder. Uh, go ahead, Mariba. I look at time, time around the, the world. If, if, you, if you have to say, you know, uh, I wanna know the, the, who has the most accurate clock on the planet. The answer is you need hundreds of them. That's the way we tell time on the world. There are atomic clocks in Russia, China, like everywhere in the world, we have atomic clocks. Each clock has an opinion of the time. We form an ensemble, a weighted combination of these things. And then the barycenter, the centroid of that, ends up being the time for the world. And you know how accurate your clock is by the difference between what's on your watch and the barycenter of the hundreds of opinions. That's what we need to do for space. It's the critical reason for getting all these opinions. And whether that comes from people that we have Ge geopolitical issues with or not, the aggregation of the data, the statistical consistency, the very center of the opinions, that's where we need to get to. That's a great point. And, and having more and more actors then uh, who are participating in this, including governmental and non-governmental ones, academics, those all add to the, the number of clocks. <laughs>
so that's one of the aspects of a commercial offering that you're able to uh, avoid, or at least the implications. Some other networks, uh, nationalities, they may protect the data that they're receiving off your sensor networks uh, or do not want to share it based on uh, either cultural or national security aspects or whatnot. Uh, so we avoid a lot of those uh, type of implications with a commercial offering. Um, there would be challenges still, regardless, um, depending as we're a U.S. company, what would come in that. But uh, overall, it is an unclassified capability, so you avoid some of those uh, issues. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for the opportunity to ask a question. And uh, thanks in particular to the panelists for this really fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed getting the, the technical details here. Um, you know, one of the, the issues we've been talking a lot about in this conference is uh, how space situational awareness will help us to uh, view and the behaviors. Uh, uh, if we come up with norms of responsible behavior, SSA will be that essential component of helping us understand or see behaviors. But a question we get from a lot of other countries is how can they help us, uh, how can they, without a lot of SSA capabilities, view and understand these behaviors? So I'd welcome the panelists' ideas on how we can work with other countries. Are there programs that we could work with other countries to help them develop their SSA capabilities so that uh, in the future it's not just the United States saying a behavior is going on, but as Mariba was talking about, we have all of these other data sources that can then be combined to say, here's our agreement on what is going on. Thanks. And I'll, I'll pass that on to, to Regina. There, there was also another question there asking about geographical distribution. Um, and if there are any other lessons that we can learn from um, uh, other areas, uh, on verification and using data tools and data sets from around the world um, to assist uh, with verification? There's several aspects. One of them relates to burden sharing. I think um, this is something that we, we see on the European side. We have nascent capabilities. I mean, we have lots of different ones, but they're uh, not as powerful as the ones that we currently benefit from, which is uh, the US uh, capabilities. But we um, we are keen to, um, to, to enhance our capabilities in order to engage in burden sharing and also to share um, what we have with the rest of the community in the sense of, um, uh, the sense of products. So I think there's um, many ways in uh, cooperating and complementing each other with different capabilities and with different, um, with different uh, products. Um, and I think in, in that context, um, I think that the point um, or the, the, uh, the reference to um, to states and maybe also non-state actors who don't necessarily have um, lots of space capabilities, who maybe don't have SSA capabilities, is really, really excellent because um, we cannot do SSA, um, nobody can do SSA by themselves unless they're a sufficiently large actor. And there are so many components from geographical locations that are important that we could uh, cooperate on and placing certain sensors all the way to, um, you know, building um, uh, cutting edge algorithms. Um, if you want to do that, you don't necessarily need to have a huge um, uh, SSA or um, um, uh, space capability at all. If, you, if you're great in, in, uh, in, in, in machine learning or in AI. Um, and then, of course, um, there's human expertise. I mean, we've, even in Europe, we have some, um, some uh, contributions from, from countries who maybe not very pronounced in space, but they have fantastic uh, flight dynamics expertise. And I think all of that together can really help. And I think um, when we look at, uh, at um, elements that um, state and non-state actors can provide that don't necessarily relate directly only to maneuverable assets, I think we're, we're on the right path and finding some tailored um, contributions for everyone. Marie, but what about you, sir? You, uh, you get data from all over the world? How do you pull all of that together and how does it help you to get a better uh, picture with, through Astrograph? One of the things that um, many, many years ago, I, uh, in looking at how to do this sort of thing, I was looking at the information giants, right? The Googles, Amazons, uh, Facebooks, that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, it dawned on me that uh, trying to force people to give you something in a specific format is game over. So, so for one, it was it it uh, it was important for me to recognize. Can I come up with a framework? And and Astrograph is a, a knowledge graph database. Can I come up with a framework that pulls in information regardless of its format, uh, structure, that sort of thing? Build interpreters that then take the essential elements of information out of each source and map that into this you know knowledge graph database that then I can uh, make accessible for querying 
by anybody around the globe. So we've developed uh, an initial version of that with Astrograph. And in fact, the place where we can collaborate with anybody on the planet is called Arcade. So if people just Google Arcade, Astria, uh, IBM, they will find it. They can get an account today, right now. And you know, through API mach machine, machines can communicate with uh, Arcade and start pulling in state vectors from anything in the catalog and all that other stuff. So, so yeah. And one of the, I guess, um, challenges, you know, in this endeavor again is building the interpreters to basically interpret the different sources of information and then trying to get some assessment of those dimensions of data quality that I spoke to you about. Uh, earlier, because that definitely can either you know cloud or 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 indicate what's the best way in which to interpret uh, you know said mm -hmm. information and that sort of stuff. And and I think really quick, I want to just really underscore what uh, Regina said about um, you know how other countries look. You know, there's some places that don't have. SSA sensors, but they're great at algorithm development. They're excellent, I don't know, math, applied mathematicians, for instance, or great at AI, or even something quite different, which is just really great decision makers. Maybe there's some cultures that, for whatever reason, it's like they're the world, they're humanity's uh, apex of decision making. Well, can we apply some of your, your, your decision making awesomeness to help us do stuff in space? And I also think that you know, this is where the capacity building is critical because if one of the issues with SSA, right, the reason we're having some of this discussion is because the actual practice of space operations and whatnot is, 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 is very, is varied across humanity, right? There's a lot of variance of how people operate their stuff in space and there's ambiguity with that. But the knowledge, the knowledge about space operations, that is also uneven. Uh, even, you know, with my own dealings, you know, giving lectures for NATO, uh, Science and Technology Organization, just across the NATO alliance, I can tell you that different countries I went to, which I won't mention here, uh, very different uh, knowledge about stuff in space. And so if if the knowledge is uneven, the practice is guaranteed to be uneven. Mm. So if we want common practice, we need common knowledge. And that there, therein lies, I think, the, the critical importance of capacity building. Where should we be promoting and trying to develop these space situational awareness characteristics? Um, you know, should the UN be looking at trying to harmonize some of these capabilities? Is this, a, uh, should this be uh, national governments? Um, should we be trying to promote a commercial SSA uh, uh, sector that can provide this information? You know, what do you all see as being some of the, the most um, you know, possible, uh, possibly fruitful avenues that we could be pursuing to make sure that these SSA capabilities develop. So, so Daniel, real quick, you, you, uh, do you use Waze? I use Google Maps. Okay, so I use Waze because it's actually better than Google Maps, man. Level up, level up, dude. So here's the thing, right? So, so Waze is a participatory sensing network. Um, everybody, everybody who uses the app can actually be a contributor. So the user community can also contribute information, right? And there's algorithms in the background that help predict traffic and these sorts of things. And users can say, yep, I see something on the side of the road. Can you confirm it? That sort of stuff, right? SSA should be similar to ways in space. Mm. So there is no, you know, should it be the UN? Should it be commercial? It's everybody. Like everybody on the planet has some stake of stuff in space. I think we need to be going more towards this idea of a ways for space where no single entity completely governs or reigns over this sort of thing. We have independent nodes around the globe that both contribute to the knowledge and can basically recover that knowledge, hopefully at some point in near real time. And maybe if you want exquisite SSA, well, you pay for that. That's there's a premium on that sort of stuff. There's basic stuff that helps you figure out the traffic and the patterns and, and whatnot. And if you want something more than that, then certainly you, you can pay for that, uh, you know, with commercial SSA capability. So I think there can be gradients 
of capability offered with regards to SSA, but I think it needs to be delivered as a participatory sensing network like a Waze app. From a commercial uh, aspect, uh, can definitely inform that conversation, and I think that's uh, probably, probably the best contribution we could provide, right? So through a data contract with the various governments, we can inform their, uh, their, their need to develop whatever uh, governance and compliance models that they choose to uh, this ties into the question that Eric posed uh, from the floor just a minute ago, right? Uh, how can how can uh, non-state foreign nations participate in this discussion? They can access a commercial product. Um, you can get the the 19 million measurements that were collected the past 30 days uh, from our radar network. Um, the 750,000 observations that are that are developed every day for our network, and then start crunching on those numbers to develop their own. Uh, contributions into the wider uh, global discussion on how do we sustain space overall. So these are accessible without the investment into uh, infrastructure uh, from a variety of governments to build out a network of their own, right? Commercial is taken up on ourselves because we see an industry there uh, that can inform an official uh, discussion. From the aspect of the governments, though, who has the authority or at least the license, if you would, to declare this is how we're going to do it. We believe that is closely uh, held by the governments. But uh, from from an industry perspective, we'd love to inform all of those discussions for them to, uh, to to turn on in bodies such as this one to say, here here are the facts from a variety of, net, of, of sensors. Uh, we believe our sensors are very active, very good to do this. I think uh, other sensors can contribute to this discussion as well. You can do a comparative analysis, come up with a very good mm. model for what can be implemented in the future. So um, there's a lot of potential here, um, allowing that investment cost to be, to be taken on by investors into the commercial market, alleviates governments to do the work that's necessary, which is turn on the data to derive what are those norms of behavior, mm. what are those patterns of behavior, what are those long-term uh, 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 rules of the road that we have to establish and implement so that we sustain ability and to this specific discussion, how we can differentiate hostile versus non hostile activities or yeah. develop. Uh, how do we signal to each other in space that we are making a safe maneuver or a responsible maneuver? Uh, those are aspects that, um, that developing this type of rich data set allows us to, uh, to gain access to rapidly. Yeah, I think maybe I, I just underscore the point again that we see it in a, in a burden sharing way. So currently, we're doing it bottom up, even though, of course, there's lots of uh, thinking, I think, globally. And, you know, should there be, as, as you highlighted, you know, maybe one entity in the in the in the far future. But I think at the moment, we really see it as a, as a bottom up way, um, growing it like that and, and contributing to the to the burden sharing and uh, globally on on that uh, on that path. We've been hearing uh, several comments, of course, about how verification isn't necessarily uh, necessary for a treaty. Um, you know, of course, the Outer Space Treaty, for example, um, no, there's a prohibition on nuclear weapons of weapons of mass destruction in orbit. Um, and at least to date, nobody has raised any complaints about the fact that there's no verification mechanism for that. Um, what do you think makes the current situation different? Why, um, you know, for example, why would your, uh, why do you see that certain countries are saying like, no, if we're going to have an agreement this time around, you know, verification needs to be a part of it. Well, I, I can't speak to the, you know, the policy aspects of why certain uh, countries may or may not uh, want it. But I think from a technical perspective, we're looking at something that is much more complex in a way that we haven't um, seen before. And I think um, we're inviting um, misinterpretation if we cannot um, see or if we cannot understand certain activities. And I think there are many, many different ways um, um, to provide this transparency and this confidence um, to, to one another. And I think uh, it's almost that if we're really looking at verification as a step that you're doing after an event has unfolded or has happened, it's almost too late. So there's a lot of different ways um, that I think many uh, in the current uh, discourse are proposing to act responsibly, to be transparent, to increase this kind of confidence. But I think in the end of the day, um, we've uh, maybe seen some other networks. I mean, they, they've already been highlighted, I think also yesterday in the discussion where um, for some uh, for some um, areas, we, we do have networks and we can um, bring, bring those together uh, for other types of agreements. But I think um, the currently we're really at the cusp of a fundamental change in orbit and, and we'll need to think about 
um, uh, very carefully about how we can do verification and and what kind of uh, means that we rely upon national technical means or you know globally available means um, that we can do that uh, type of transparency uh, and this anticipation um, prior to an event not happening um, and I'm, I'm looking um, and I'm for, in, in terms of my background I looked a lot into normal accident theory and of course we don't want to see an accident and um, um, an accident or, or not having an accident is the ideal uh, um, uh, situation that we want to uh, that we want to see and not having to verify something is the ideal um, um, uh, situation that we want to see but we need the means in terms of the verification what, what makes this different let me put it this way so as you said we have treaties and there's no verification necessarily related to that let's just look at uh, the one on US UN, UN space object registry right it says Register your, your object as soon as it's practicable. We we did, we, we went, Astrograph went, grabbed the data in PDFs and all this other stuff, brought it in Astrograph and we said, okay, how long is it taking for people to register their objects? How do they interpret as soon as it's practicable, right? I'm looking at, uh, and by the way, we have a website with all this that people can can go grab this stuff, but it's like, I don't know, you know, we developed a, a five star rating system where for five stars, five stars is if you registered within 120 days, four stars, if beyond 120 days, it took you a year to register three stars. If it took you two years, two stars, three years and, and so on. And I have to tell you, um, most of the countries, most of the countries that register their objects on average, on average are between four and three stars. So four and three stars, that's saying it's taking them between one to two years to register their objects. And that's as soon as it's practicable. Look for SSA, we can't do that. We have, we have a complex system that we have orbital highways that are becoming more congested. Orbital carrying capacity is becoming more saturated. And to, you know, to Regina's point, you know, this is, this situation is different. Like we can't, we can't just not uh, measure this stuff, not verify because you can't manage what you don't know. You don't know what you don't measure. This can't be this treaty that, oh, 20 years from now, we're gonna try to see how people were interpreting this thing to see if maybe the intent of the treaty. So I think that's just bad news. We can't, we should not follow that same path for this. Folks, you're going to have to bear with me because uh, some of the questions that are coming in are really complex. Um, and so I'm just trying to distill what, what's coming through here. Quick question for uh, for the technical folks. So, Curtis, um, I think this might, uh, this is for you and Mariba. Um, low Earth orbit constellations, large constellations. We loosely call them mega constellations sometimes. Um, is this making it, or have these complicated the ability to track objects? in Leo and also to be able to discern uh, perhaps other nefarious activities that might be happening subtly uh, in low earth orbit. Responsible users of space uh, will disseminate their information on where objects are and how they're operating. I mean, that's, that's uh, what we see happening right now. Um, those are very well governed, well operated. Uh, the big challenge is already there. Um, uh, aspect of these things. These pieces are ungoverned. They're not old. They're derelict. They they go. They go. Um, that actually presents more of a challenge to the large constellations that we see right now. Uh, relationships with uh, many of the companies that are uh, that are operating large constellations are very healthy. Um, we provide them data. They fit us data. We do a cross compare, and we're able to uh, uh, derive solutions uh, jointly to uh, uh, ensure safe. Uh, operation on orbit. So, uh, does it make it complicated? Well, yes, because you have to derive new tools and new methods of uh, conducting operations and developing useful information. Um, but that's a that's part of the growth of what we're doing. Uh, if you look long term for the for the implementation of these large orbits, the benefit to uh, humans on the planet is actually really good. Uh, uh, global internet is one thing. Internet to uh, uh, handheld devices is another thing. Uh, who knows what other products are going to come out of these uh, capabilities uh, uh, for uh, uh, inhabitants of the Earth overall as the uh, capabilities. 
what's important to take away from here though is that these operators that are doing these activities now are in fact establishing the norms of behavior. They're out there first, they're doing these things. We are all learning together. Um, but uh, I don't I don't think it makes it harder. Um, we just have to learn through these. It's 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 part of the challenge, but I think we can handle it. Um, it's cleaning up space, which is gonna be the harder challenge. From my perspective, I, I tend to look at it in terms of environmental impact, so orbital carrying capacity. And so the number of objects in and of itself isn't necessarily the problem. It's it's the combination of number of objects with ambiguity. It's uncertainty. Mm. Uh, uncertainty is the driver for for the complication. And it's the thing that I said already is not respected. People aren't respecting the problem because they're not really accounting for that the you know realistic measures of uncertainty. So there's this thing called uncertainty quantification. It's like a thing. It's 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 it, there's a formalism behind it. That's not being applied in any sort of rigor to this problem. And case in point, right? It's like I don't know. All of us are driving on 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 an autobahn in Germany. We're we're you know we're all in our BMWs next to Regina. We're all like going down the autobahn, and it's a clear day. Everything's nice. Bring in the London fog. What happens? Bad things happen. Cars get into accidents. Take away the fog, things return to normalcy. In that problem, I didn't change the number of objects. All I did was make things more uncertain. That uncertainty is the big driver. And in terms of carrying capacity, I look at air traffic and the number of planes that we fly into LAX and stuff today, there's no way we could have done that 50 years ago, right? So technology and reducing uncertainty helps us pack more planes in the air. We may find out, Daniel, that if we can reduce the uncertainty, we may say, we're not launching enough. We don't have enough objects on orbit. We need more mega constellations. Does, Marie, but does that uncertainty though, does it um, benefit actors that might wanna engage in covert or nefarious activities? Of course activities? it does, man. Of course it does. Because everybody says that they want to know where everything is, like on, on the net's rear end kind of thing. But at the same time, when you say, okay, well, you need to furnish all this information to remove the ambiguity, then it's crickets. Then it's, well, I don't, I don't want to do that, or I don't feel comfortable with doing that, but I want everybody else to do it. So, mm -hmm. so there's this chicken and the egg kind of thing going on, which is really frustrating to me. And I, I say this, right? People need to do the following three things. This is how you're gonna measure, here's how I measure uh, good faith from the community. What are you doing to make space A more transparent? What's your thing? What can it do? What is it capable of doing? That sort of stuff. How are you making the domain more predictable? Not just the physics, but in any given situation, can you agree to what you're gonna do and the decision-making criteria for that? And then the last one is, what are you doing to provide information that others can use to hold you accountable for your behaviors. So I would go to every operator, I would go to different countries and say, you, you really want to play nice in SSA and STM? Show me evidence where you're making things more transparent, more predictable, and accountability. And in that measure, I'm going to be saying, yeah, you're really awesome for SSA STM. But until that, it's just a lot of lip service, man. A lot of people saying that they're really awesome, but they're not really furnishing all this information to fill those three buckets. This question is coming from Julia Pavesi from the University of Leuven. When we're talking about SSA and especially um, data sharing, there's a lot of uh, a lot of information coming from different sources, and some of it might have different margins of error. How do you account for those margins of error and for lack of transparency in some of the the information that's available? And then later on down the road, and Regina, maybe you have an idea on this. Um, if something happens and uh, things don't go so well. How do we maybe uh, form a dispute settlement uh, capability, particularly when it has to deal with satellites that are mm, perhaps security related? Again, I'm, I'm speaking with the European hat. I, I think um, what we do is we we don't um, provide um, you know recommendations, um, and and we're not liable for these for providing these uh, products, and and someone uses them in a certain way, for instance, maneuvers a satellite. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of ways, um, a lot of mechanisms to kind of um, uh, protect yourself from that. But I think the, the essential question is, um, how can we ensure that we um, have data that we can 
uh, that is interoperable in a sense that we can combine and that we can really put into a true picture that we can then actually use. And I think that's the that's the tricky question right now. And we've highlighted um, today uh, in the panel already many um, aspects where you know we need to do a lot of synchronization, a lot of reconciling of different data, a lot of comparison of different um, covariances or algorithms or um, perturbations, um, you know, all these impacts that we have uh, on these un on these uncertainties that we see and whether we can we can smooth them out in a way. And um, I can just say that um, uh, from from our perspective, that really necessitates a technical dialogue that is often um, quite uh, painstaking and, and painful for uh, uh, over years, um, you know, really putting technical experts together and then making them um, propose mechanisms or ideas to the policy level or let's say the implementing um, uh, level um, implementing these types of corporations for SSA uh, in order to see whether they are then compatible with uh, sharing agreements that we may already have on a much much higher level so I think it necessitates a lot of dialogue across the different levels of abstraction from from the technical to the policy side so I'm going to get a bit nerdy here and and again I'm going to talk about this thing that I that I'm developing called MEMS for uh, maximum entropy, minimum surprisal. So here's the thing: um, uncertainty quantification, typical two types of uncertainty: aleatory, which is due to inherent randomness, and epistemic, which is due to systematic effects or ignorance. We have to approach SSA with taking into account those two types of uncertainty. A. The second thing is again, we need to enumerate all the hypotheses that are possible, not necessarily what's probable, but what are the things that are possible given the evidence? And we have to represent that ensemble of hypotheses and then say, okay, anytime we get new evidence, let's have each hypothesis, which in and of itself is confirmation bias, it's prejudiced, give an opinion on what it predicts the evidence is gonna be. The difference between the prediction and what we actually observe, let's call that surprisal. So when you know the truth exactly, there's zero surprise. You have nothing to learn because you've predicted what's actually happened. We rarely do that sort of stuff. So let's look for those hypotheses that are minimally surprised given the evidence to investigate that sort of thing further. So that's exactly what I think uh, we need to use in this kind of approach. And you're right, different, different entities are gonna provide information with different uncertainties and some provide stuff, opinions with no uncertainty whatsoever. This is where we need to, this is the reason why we need to have that ensemble of hypotheses so that we can accommodate our level of ignorance and only get rid of the hypotheses that have been shown by the evidence to be impossible. So there's this guy, Karl Popper, he has this thing called the fa falsifiability principle, right? It's like only remove the hypothesis which evidence tells you is no longer possible. Over the course of the last day and a half, two days, uh, we've heard a lot of ideas getting thrown around out there about, um, you know, what are the threats uh, that are currently exist for space security, and what are some of the measures that we might actually take to to deal with them. We've talked about uh, prohibitions on anti satellite testing. Uh, we've talked about uh, maybe safety zones for rendezvous proximity operations. Uh, a whole host of things. Um, of this panoply of things that that we've discussed over the last couple of days. Just for the three of you, um, has anything jumped out at you that you thought, yep, we could absolutely monitor that. We could tell you who did it. We could tell you when they did it uh, with a high level of certainty. Um, that technology definitely exists. Um, you know, what could it be? And, and you, know, you know, maybe this could become the subject of a treaty one day. I, I think there is a, what I would say is the ability to have a robust global sensor network is, is um, this is not a pipe dream. It's not a paper rocket that we see a lot uh, in the space community. Um, uh, from a commercial app, we are building out uh, the 24 uh, radar sites around the planet where you'll, you'll be able to derive a large data set. So having a large data set can be very helpful in informing the conversations that need to have to implement any type of uh, rule set or understanding, or to Mariba's point, uh, to start eliminating some of those uh, unknowns. Uh, or committing some of those hypotheses that are just uh, out of this world. Uh, so first and foremost, having a, a robust sensor network to derive or at least to develop and generate the right amount of mm. data to start this 
uh, is feasible and possible. It's not an obtainium. It is actually uh, right there for our taking. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, of uh, banging at these radars. We're, we're putting one out every six months right now uh, to get to this uh, end state that we're looking at. Um, so this is not uh, this is not something that's that's uh, a pipe dream. We're able to do it. So that's one aspect of this. I'm sure there's another uh, whole nother world of, of capabilities coming out of this conference that will inform that. First and foremost, the data sets there. It's being developed right now. People can access immediately and start the work that uh, we're all talking about that we need to do. We can start to. I, I would echo Curtis's point on you know reducing some of the uncertainty that we already can by providing conjunction analysis and uh, you know with the help of of some of the the large players already that we've talked about and and reducing the risks that we have or the the, the ambiguities and the cons complexity that we have through safety of flight and operational risks and I think that's that already. Um, uh, enables us to go a long way into then really honing into the things that we may have to verify or not. Many thanks to everyone for for coming. Um, I miss you all. I can't wait to to be back in Geneva with you in person. Um, but of course, I've left you all in such good hands. I'm with Anna and Letitia. I know we're a really great team, and they're going to keep up the uh, the tradition of the Space Security Conference. <music>